Hello, and welcome to this video conversation about the radical feminist Shulamit Firestone and her views on women, biology, and technology. The conversation is a collaboration between the Bergen Public Library and the Center for Women's and Gender Research at the University of Bergen. My name is Klaus Holberg, and I'm a philosopher and a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Women's and Gender Research. To discuss Firestone and her contemporary relevance, I'm honored and delighted to be joined today by Dr. Victoria Margri. Margri is principal lecturer in the School of Humanities and member of the Center for Applied Philosophy, Politics and Ethics at the University of Brighton in the UK. She is a specialist in the literature of the 19th and 20th centuries, in women's writing, feminist theory, and critical social theory more generally. Among her extensive output as a literary scholar and critical theorist, we find this book, which I'm afraid you will see mixed up from left to right, but never mind, from 2018, and it's titled Neglected or Misunderstood, the Radical Feminism of Shulamit Firestone. After reading that book, I knew I wanted to talk with this author. So thank you so much for joining me today, Vicky. Uh, thank you, Klaus. Thank you very, very much for, for this invitation. Um, and thank you to, to your centre for organising this and to the Bergen Public Library. I'm, I'm really glad to be taking part in this. Wonderful. Uh, so for the record, our conversation was originally scheduled to take place in person uh, at the Bergen Public Library uh, this week, actually. And we had both been looking very much forward to that. Um, but as we all know, due to the unfolding pandemic and continuing traveling restrictions, we decided to make it happen digitally, this time around at least. So before we proceed, I'd like to take a few moments to further introduce and contextualize a little bit uh, our topic for today. Shulamit Firestone published her manifesto titled The Dialectic of Sex, The Case for Feminist Revolution in 1970. So last year was the 50 years anniversary for that first issue of that book. And with this book, as well as with her role as an activist, Firestone became both a leading and a controversial figure in the wave of women's liberation movement that rose in the late 60s and early 70s. Firestone argued that the roots of women's oppression lie in women's role in human reproduction, and particularly uh, in virtue of uh, pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding. From this, Firestone concluded that women's liberation can only come through development of technologies that will move the reproductive process entirely outside the female body. These days, state leaders like the current Norwegian Prime Minister, for example, urge women to have more babies and also to have them earlier. This is necessary, uh, the, these state leaders claim, because the presently low fertility rates are putting the future of the welfare state in jeopardy. Also, abortion laws are back on the political agenda in many countries. Uh, in the Norwegian context, it looks like it's going in the, in the direction of liberation, but that's uh, quite a different matter in, in, uh, all, in other places, I know. And add to this the recent advances in reproductive technologies that could soon make it possible to gestate a child outside the female body. And it would seem that Firestone's analyses are as relevant now as they ever were. This, at least, is what Vicky's book has brought home to me. So, to start off our conversation, Vicky, uh, let me first ask you uh, about the story behind your book. Uh, how uh, 
did you come around to the idea of, of writing uh, this book in the first place and, and when? Well, I guess it was in 2016 and um, it, it was a process actually that involved quite a lot of contingency. So about 10 years prior to that, I had begun my job at the University of Brighton and I had inherited um, a kind of existing feminisms module. This is for, for final year undergraduate students. Um, and that feminisms module had a week on Firestone. And I have to admit, and this feels like a bit of a confession, um, but I hadn't actually read Firestone, so I didn't, I didn't particularly know about her. So I inherited this reading list as one does when you are a, a kind of junior lecture, lecturer. Um, and I had to teach Firestone, so I had to read Firestone. I, I read this text, I found it fascinating, problematic, flawed, insightful, um, provocative, all of those things. And I spent years teaching it to, to students who responded in similar ways, really, kind of interested um, and provoked by it. So what happened in 2016 is that one of my current students, um, Samantha, who I thank very much for this, sent me an email, which was a call for proposals from the publisher Zero Books. So Zero were interested in publishing um, a book on Firestone that would function as a kind of introduction to Firestone's work. So this was part of a series, Neglected or Misunderstood, which was intended to think who are the kind of important thinkers or, or writers that have been forgotten or that haven't received their kind of due attention or that have been remembered but, been, but misunderstood in certain ways. And they thought that, that Firestone was a prime candidate for such a book. So I received that email. I was very interested in it. I put together a couple of paragraphs for the publisher. They were interested and it went from there really. Um, and the resulting book is very much a book I think that is formed out of my experience of having taught Firestone to undergraduate students for many years. Um, and yeah, it's very much come out of those, those discussions. All right. Um, at least um, your reading of, of uh, Firestone, your first encounter with Firestone uh, or with, with a book preceded my own uh, by many, many years. Uh, I only read it uh, the first time, I think, in 2018 uh, while, while a visiting scholar at, at Duke University. So um, uh, that's my confession, <laughs> at least. But I, I, I read, read your book kind of uh, in conjunction with, with reading the original. So that was a, a very rewarding experience. Um, your introductory chapter in the book uh, is subtitled In Defense of Science Fiction. And uh, this, uh, this heading uh, kind of signals uh, your approach to, to Firestone's book, her, her manifesto, as a work of science fiction. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, absolutely. So um, when Firestone's book was published in 1970, it was, um, it was a sensation, really. I mean, apparently some copies of it were kind of um, on sale on supermarket shelves. And Firestone had absolutely been aiming at a, a kind of mainstream audience. Um, but as a sensation, it was very controversial. So many people found it fantastic, but it was also um, denounced and condemned on many fronts. And one of the criticisms of it, and it's been a kind of enduring criticism, is that it reads like science fiction. So um, uh, I'm sure we'll be exploring this later, but Firestone envisages a post-revolutionary society in which um, technology will have been appropriated for humane and compassionate purposes. Human beings will no longer need to take part in um, alienated labour. And also very importantly, human beings can be brought into the world through artificial wombs. So one of the ways that Firestone and her work has often been dismissed is to say, this is just science fiction. This isn't credible political theory. Um, and that interested me because I'm a literary scholar 
as well as a, a kind of a, a scholar of feminist theory. And I think science fiction is an incredibly valuable genre. So I thought, well, let's think about this manifesto as science fiction. I think actually one can, one can make a positive case for it as science fiction. So what I mean by that is that I think um, one of the very valuable things that science fiction can do is it can, in presenting us with um, an alternative future, a kind of a future version of the world, or at least just a, simply an alternative version of our own world, it can better, it can get us to better reflect upon our current arrangements. And I think that's what Firestone does. She asks us to imagine radically different ways of thinking about how parenting might work, of thinking about what life might be like for young people, of thinking about what education would be like, of thinking about what life might be like in a society where we no longer need to work five days a week. You know, what would we do with our time, for example? And in asking us to think seriously about those possibilities and almost to try to imagine them and place ourselves imaginatively in that alternative world, I think Firestone's book helps us to think better about our present circumstances. It does that, I think, because it estranges us from those circumstances a little bit. It, it allows them to seem unfamiliar to us. Um, <clears throat> now, one consequence of that imaginative activity might be that there are aspects of our current arrangements that we want to continue with. But the point would be that that would now be a deliberate decision because we've been able to reflect upon those arrangements differently and see what is valuable about them. But another possibility is that we might decide that we want to do things differently. But again, that's a decision that's been made possible because we've had the, the, the vantage point of being able to think that, that present circumstances could change. They could be different and they could even potentially be quite radically different. Hmm. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, along these lines, um, approaching uh, Firestone's manifesto as a work of science fiction uh, could perhaps um, be seen to allow you a, a sort of um, a slightly ironical distance, perhaps, to some of the, the obvious flaws of it. So, so you're not kind of committed to take everything very uh, equally seriously or equally literally, perhaps, um, but but to see it more as as an experiment in in, in vision, perhaps. Um, that, that makes makes sense to me. I think that's absolutely mm. right, and. Mm. Um, other writers on Firestone have observed a similar thing, that in one sense Firestone's book can be thought of as a thought experiment. Um, you know, philosophy does thought experiments where it asks you to imagine some kind of fictive scenario and think what might be one's responses to that scenario, what might be the right thing to do in it. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, Firestone's manifesto, particularly the final chapter where she paints this, this, this picture of an alternative society, is a thought experiment in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. And I also agree with you about the kind of um, the ironic ironic distance, perhaps as well from Firestone's own own text. You know, not, not everything she says in, in the book, I think, is advanced with total seriousness. There's um, often a, a tongue-in-cheek quality to what she is claiming or arguing. Um, Humour, sarcasm even, is quite an important mode of her writing. Right. Um, perhaps I could ask you to uh, uh, speak a little bit more about uh, Shulamit Firestone, the person and her, her life. Um, the trajectory that led her from being uh, the daughter uh, in an Orthodox Jewish family to through art studies and to become a, a vigorous organizer of, of uh, feminist uh, uh, activism. Yes, um, so she was born in, in Canada. Her family um, relocated to the American Midwest at, at some point in 
in Firestone's childhood. She, um, uh, so uh, apparently she rebelled very much against the religious orthodoxy of her family, particularly of her father. And apparently it was a very traditional family in terms of gender roles. So Firestone very much rebelled against the expectation that she would do housework and that her brother wouldn't have to do housework, that she would have to make his bed, etc. Um, so I think that there are tensions within the kind of family um, set up. Tensions to do with um, her father's uh, interpretation of, of their religion. Firestone and her family also experienced, I think, significant anti-Semitism um, from, from the, uh, from the, the neighbourhood. So Firestone, as a, as a young woman, went to the Art Institute of Chicago to study painting. She eventually got a degree in painting from there. And I think it was probably at Chicago's Art Institute that she became particularly politicised, particularly um, radicalised. So in Chicago, she did set up one of the first women's groups, a kind of small radical feminist group, a consciousness raising group. She then moved to New York in 1967, and New York was really the place where she became particularly active as a feminist. So again, she set up a number of very influential um, activist feminist groups, and she became, became involved in um, various forms of activism, co uh, protests against Miss World contests, for example, an abortion speak out where she organised a number of women to talk about their experiences of having had an abortion. So she was, um, I mean, you know, we tend to remember her today, I suppose, as a, as a writer, but it's important to say that she was also an activist and she wrote her book, her manifesto, as part of the kind of um, ferment of early feminist activism. Mm -hmm. uh, and the book itself, um... I think I might have heard or read somewhere that it was written in a kind of fervor in a, in a few months, right? Yes, I believe that's right. In 1969? Yes. Mm. And that completely blows my mind because it's such uh, an exquisite piece of writing uh, in terms of its literary qualities, but also for its uh, theoretical sophistication. So that completely... That, that completely blows my mind and, and she was 25 when, when she she wrote that, right? Absolutely, yes. Mm. Uh, that, mm. that blows my mind as well. I think back to myself as a 25 year old and I'm, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> stunned and deeply impressed by Firestone, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, women's liberation movement and feminism uh, in, in Firestone's um, heyday, so to speak. Um, uh, she, she is um, standardly considered um, to be part of the, the radical feminist uh, branch, so to speak. Um, and what, what adds sense to, to the concept of radical feminism is its difference from, from the other types of, of feminism that were around at the time. So um, could you speak a little bit to how you see, how you would map that? That landscape. Uh, I, I know you, you write in the book that uh, the, the idea of, of, of placing uh, Firestone absolutely in one or the other category tends to obscure more than it, it clarifies, but, but for viewers who might not be um, very familiar with the history, it might be helpful nonetheless. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's the kind of standard history of um, feminism, particularly second wave feminism, so in other words, the feminism of the 1960s and 1970s, yeah, yeah. is that there are three main strands. Um, so one of them is liberal feminism, and liberal feminism inherits um, philosophical and political liberalism, really, and it focuses upon the kind of the rights of the individual and the right of the individual to pursue their freedom and their autonomy um, without facing unjust constraints, basically. Um, so liberal feminism was probably the, the, the most influential and dominant early form of feminism within the 1960s. It's 
very much associated with Betty Friedan. So Betty Friedan in 1963 had published um, a book called The Feminine Mystique. Um, so Friedan was a, a, a US writer as well. Um, and the feminine, the feminine Mystique was a kind of best seller. It argued that women across America who supposedly uh, were living the dream because they were living in suburban homes, they were married, they had 2.4 children, they had you know, washing machines and, and, um, and vacuum cleaners and things like that, that these women were actually not feeling fulfilled. Um, on the contrary, they were living lives of, of quiet desperation, suffering from what Friedan called the problem with no name. And Friedan's analysis of this problem was that actually women were suffering through their restriction to the domestic sphere. Actually, for many women, a life within the home and within the family was not enough. And what was needed was for women to be able to continue into higher education, to have careers, to compete um, for employment on the same basis that, that men could. So Friedan's book was really a kind of important instance of liberal feminism. It emphasises the needs of the individual, the need of the individual women for freedom, for self-determination, and to have equal opportunities with, with men. So um, liberal feminism is typically described as being reformist rather than revolutionary. And what that is getting at is the idea that liberal feminism is saying, broadly speaking, the existing social and economic system that we have is okay, but what's not okay about it is that women are treated unfairly. Um, they don't have the same opportunities that men have. So what is needed are some limited reforms in order to give women those same opportunities. In contrast to liberal feminism or reformist feminism more generally, we typically have socialist or Marxist feminism on the one hand, and then radical feminism on the other hand. So both of those feminisms are revolutionary in the sense that they are saying the existing system is not broadly okay, it's fundamentally wrong, and it needs to be overhauled. We need radical change, um, change from the bottom up, basically. So um, Marxist feminism of the 1960s and 1970s goes back to the classical Marxist tradition of Karl Marx's work and Friedrich Engels's work. It typically finds Marx's theorization of the situation of women to be inadequate, but it says we can make that analysis more adequate. Um, Marxist feminism tends to say that the, the basis of women's oppression, and it is oppression for them, lies in economic factors. In contrast to that, we have radical feminism. So radical feminism, which as you say, Firestone is typically associated with, is also revolutionary in that it says women are oppressed across culture. Women are not simply oppressed in the workplace, for example. Women are oppressed in um, the family, in marital relations, in all aspects really, really of women's lives. But radical feminists tends to reject a Marxist framework. They say that if we take that Marxist framework and we then try to fit women's experiences into it, we are going to distort women's experiences. Instead, they say we need to kind of throw away existing theoretical frameworks, particularly those created by men, 19th century men in the case of Marxism, and we need to start instead with the perceptions of real women about their actual lives. And that's why the, um, the kind of consciousness raising group was so important. So the consciousness raising group is where you, get, you gather together small groups of women who in a kind of intimate setting will talk about their daily lives, will talk about their experiences of marriage, um, of motherhood, for example. <clears throat> and will build up through those discussions new concepts and new theoretical frameworks. Hmm. Thank you. Um, that makes sense. Uh, but what would you say is the, ra the radicality in radical feminism? Why is it called radical feminism, do you think? 
I think it comes back to this idea of oppression, which is a, a, a word I've been using already. Mm -hmm. So liberal feminism tended not to speak about oppression. It tended to speak about discrimination. So discrimination yeah. means that in certain limited aspects of a woman's life, women are not being treated on the same basis mm -hmm. as men and that there is no justification for that differential treatment. So radical feminists thought that that was a deeply inadequate way of conceptualizing the mm -hmm. problem. Um, radical feminists would, uh, would say, yes, of course, it's the case that women, for example, are discriminated against when they apply for um, a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, that's only symptomatic of a much deeper structural problem. Mm -hmm. And that much deeper structural problem is that our very culture, you know, every aspect really of the society that we live in, the lives that we live, our values and our practices are male supremacist. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. assume the kind of superiority of supposedly masculine mm -hmm. ways of being, thinking, feeling, mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. um, and they systematically, I suppose, advantage men over women. Mm -hmm. So um, radical feminists are credited with particularly promoting the idea of patriarchy. Um, mm -hmm. There's different versions of what patriarchy might mean, mm -hmm. but patriarchy generally is used to describe a society that is fundamentally organised um, in the interests of men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And radical feminists argued that patriarchy was the character of all known societies throughout all history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a key difference from Marxist feminism. So Marxist feminists followed Friedrich Engels, who in the, the 19th century had argued that um, the, had argued that male dominated societies actually had an historical origin. So Engels relied upon some slightly dodgy anthropological work Mm -hmm. to suggest that um, the earliest forms of human social life, so nomadic tribes, were actually egalitarian. Um, they were egalitarians in, in terms of, of gender. But Engels thought that with the arrival of private property, women became treated as among the, the, the property or the possessions of men. Mm -hmm. So they, po they were positing an historical origin mm -hmm. to women's oppression. Mm -hmm. Radical feminists said, no, women's oppression has always existed. It's existed throughout all known time. Mm -hmm. It exists in all societies. We cannot point to any society or culture that has not fundamentally been, been organised um, mm -hmm. on the basis of the exploitation mm -hmm. of women in the interests of men. And in that sense, uh, uh, one could... Uh... Uh, correctly label uh, Firestone as a radical feminist, right? Correct. Yeah, but uh, she is not a radical feminist in the sense that she is completely um, that she wants to throw out every uh, bit of of male theorizing, so to speak. So she she is drawing on on Marx and Engels in in her in her work, as we will now uh, proceed to to consider. Um. So let's let's begin to um, expound a little bit on on Firestone's theory of, of female oppression in, in broad strokes, uh, and perhaps a way to go about that would be to uh, consider the very title of that book, the dialectic of sex. It's it's uh, it's kind of an, an enigmatic title for for a f uh, feminist manifesto. Um, so perhaps. You could uh, offer your take on on what's the dialectic in the dialectic of sex, uh, first off. I would try, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> I must admit this is a question that, that um, I think doesn't have a clear answer to it. Um, the first thing I would say is that that word dialectic in the title is indicating Firestone's connection with Marx and Engels and her use of them. So, um, as you say, this is one respect in which she is not typical of radical feminism. And that is that she takes um, Marxism extremely seriously. Um, 
so Marxism, um, Karl Marx was very much influenced by the philosopher um, Hegel. Hegel had proposed that history operates dialectically, whereby you have a particular kind of social formation that develops. It then develops a kind of an antithesis to itself, a, 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 a different possibility, and eventually you get a kind of flip. So you flip into a different kind of social formation. So there's a dialectical movement where dialectical, where dialectic means a kind of a conflict between opposing dynamic forces. So Marx responded to um, Hegel's dialectic by saying, it's correct that history is dialectical. What moves human history along is precisely a kind of conflict between um, dynamic opposing forces. But Marx wanted to say that those opposing forces are fundamentally material. They are not about ideas or spirit or consciousness as Hegel thought. Instead, they are to do with the very material questions of how human beings produce the things that they need in order to live. So production, production, productive labor, you know, how do we produce food, clothing, shelter, etc. That's what mm. interested Marx. Um, Firestone also situates herself as a materialist and she also calls for a dialectical materialist conception of history. But for her, the problem with Marx and Engels is that they were not materialist enough. Nice. So Firestone wants to say that before we think about production, in other words, how human beings sustain life, we need to think about reproduction. How does life come into existence in the first place? So Firestone says beneath the level of the production of food and other resources, we need to think about how human beings themselves get produced and reproduced, which means that we have to think about sex, we have to think about pregnancy, childbirth, and the raising of small children. So the most, the deepest material level um, that Firestone thinks we need to begin with is the level of procreation or reproduction itself. So she is proposing a dialectical materialist conception of history, but one that begins with reproduction and not production. Right, that's that's very helpful. Um, so that's, that leads us into, I guess, the other uh, element of the title, which is sex. Um, so how, how does um, uh, how, how does a consideration of, of sex and of reproduction and all that uh, make for a dialectical history of, of humanity, so to speak? So, um, <laughs> as, you, as you've kind of begun to flesh it out really in your introduction, Firestone wants to say that um, there is a fundamental biological dualism or a fundamental biological division. And it's that the species human being is split into um, people who can become pregnant and people who cannot. And Firestone simply uses the word women for people who can become pregnant. More recently, I think in response to trans feminism, for example, we're starting to recognize the inadequacy of that. Right. But Firestone in, in 1970s is very much just talking about women as being people who become pregnant. So Firestone says that um, the fact that it is women who become pregnant and give birth to children and then um, need to breastfeed small children, for example, and then typically take care of, of children as they grow, this leads to a kind of fundamental inequality. Um, she says what it means is that women are unable to participate in other aspects of social life to the same extent that men can. In particular, women are unable to take part in production to the same extent that men can because of their responsibilities in relationship to reproduction. 
And it's important, I think, to remember that, that Firestone is beginning this analysis with um, very early stages of human history or even human prehistory, where human beings would have had perhaps very little understanding of the processes of fertility and, and, and pregnancy and very little inability to control fertility. So Firestone is talking about early human history where between the ages of, you know, when menstruation first begins and menopause, a girl or a woman might be in an almost constant cycle of becoming pregnant, being pregnant, giving birth, repeat the process again without being able to control that. So Firestone's point is that societies um, where those are the, the, the kind of biological or natural conditions will become societies where women are significantly taken out of social functions, including production. They therefore become dependent upon men. And that notion of dependency is really, really important for Firestone. So she thinks that because women become dependent upon men to supply them with the necessities of life, so food, shelter, clothing, etc., that is already a kind of power imbalance. It makes women dependent, it gives men power over women. And Firestone then claims that men as a whole, as a group, enjoyed the, the power that women's dependency gave them and sought to reinforce it um, and sought even to extend it, to extend it beyond women to other groups of men by forming economic classes or by forming groups based on supposed racial differences. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, Firestone is telling us a story whereby there's um, an original an original biological difference that leads immediately to what she calls sex class. So she says women are the exploited class. Even before we have economic classes in the way that Marx recognises it, we have women who are already an exploited class because their reproductive labour is being exploited by men. And so women as the, and so that first class division is then the kind of origins of further class divisions, further mm -hmm. hierarchies, further forms of domination and oppression mm -hmm. that we see around us today. Mm -hmm. uh, and to that um, exploitation of, of women's reproductive labor, we could also, uh, in, into that there is also uh, exploitation of sexual labor, I would assume, and emotional labor, perhaps. Yes. I think that's right. Firestone doesn't un unpack it in exactly that way, but I'm, I'm sure that she would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we are arrive at the point that I find uh, a little bit, a little bit tricky to get my my head around, and it's it's the relation between uh, uh, what, what what we've now been speaking of is is what we might call the biological family, or, or Firestone's notion of the biological family. Uh, but what um, what Firestone is really getting at is the nuclear family. Um, like like many um, other, especially radical feminists and also socialist uh, feminists, perhaps uh, in her um, in her her day, um, she uh, defends a program of family abolition out of. Um, um, the idea that the nuclear family, the mother, father, child uh, a, a institution, so to speak, is uh, somehow inherently oppressive, not only for women, but also uh, for children. So how would you uh, unpack um, uh, Firestone's uh, reasons for thinking that the nuclear family, as we see it around us in the in modernity, so to speak, in modern capitalist societies, uh, is inherently oppressive, and 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 what it's what is its relation to the the biological family that we were just discussing? Yeah, thank you, and um, both really really important questions. So, I think to begin, it's useful to think about what the nuclear family would have been like in the nineteen sixties, or would often have been like in the nineteen sixties, rather than 
what it might be like today because hopefully we've we've reformed it a little bit today at least um but so in the 1960s you know yes the nuclear family would be the kind of unit of um husband and wife and biological offspring but what's also important about the nuclear family in the 60s is that the is that ideology would have had it that the father was very much the head of the household so he would have been a, a patriarch um, he might very well have been the sole breadwinner he would almost certainly have been the primary breadwinner at least and the idea was that the father did hold sway over both the children but over the kind of mother as well so that the father um, is an authoritative figure the nuclear family in the 1960s is not a family in which there is equality between um, husband and wife. So, and that, you know, seems to have been Firestone's own personal experience of the nuclear family as well, as I, as I was saying earlier. So, um, Firestone believes that this is an oppressive structure, um, as you say, because it, first of all, entails um, the kind of institutionalization of the exploitation of women. So the role of um, the, the wife within the nuclear family is very much to render her sexual services available to the husband, as you were saying a few moments ago, but also her reproductive services. So to um, fairly soon after marriage, probably become pregnant, raise children, and to focus her life around doing those things. So quite possibly not to work outside of the home, well, at least if we're talking about middle-class families and Firestone was focused upon middle-class families, often to the detriment of thinking about any other possibility. But within the middle-class nuclear family, probably wives would not be working outside of the home, certainly not once they became mothers. All of their efforts, all of their focus was expected to be on bringing up children and serving the sexual and the emotional needs of husbands. So Firestone really is saying is, is, is saying that this is a, um, a situation in which the potentials of, of, of women are going massively unfulfilled. And it's also a situation in which um, children, in a certain sense, are being oppressed. So if we think about the girl child, the girl child within the nuclear family is undergoing a kind of training in becoming the subservient, marginalised figure that her mother is. Um, so the girl child is being trained to become subservient, to, to think of herself as the second sex, as Simone de Beauvoir would say. The boy child, on the other hand, Firestone um, says, is being encouraged to think of himself as superior, to being encouraged to think of himself as um, you know, destined for manhood and as man, manhood as a kind of identity of superiority over women. And Firestone actually is very keen to say that that is a situation that's bad for boys as well as girls. Um, Firestone thinks that the nuclear family is a structure that is psychologically deforming. It's psychologically deforming because it inhibits the potential of both girl children and boy children to develop all sides of themselves. Um, it, it inhibits the potential of boys as well as girls to develop into kind of fully formed human beings who can access the full range of um, emotions and thoughts and activities that human beings are capable of. Now your, your question was also about the relationship of the nuclear family to the biological family. This is something I've wrestled with a bit because I think it's not entirely clear from Firestone's book, but I think that for her, the biological family is almost a kind of abstract idea in that the biological family is simply the biological unit of male sperm giver, um, female egg provider, and then biological offspring. So that biological family has of course been a constant of human history, right up until the point that Firestone is writing. The nuclear family is one particular 
social form that the biological family can take. So the nuclear family arose particularly in the West in the late 19th century. Um, so Firestone thinks that the, the nuclear family, in a sense, intensifies the oppressions that are already written into the biological family, no matter what form the biological family actually takes socially. So for, for Firestone, therefore, the nuclear family is really bad, <laughs> but the nuclear family also simultaneously has something quite good about it, which is that it reveals the problem. Precisely because it's so bad, it reveals that the, the problem itself lies in the biological family and the relationships of dependency and domination that grow out of those biological relationships. Mm -hmm. so, so in a sense, the, the nuclear family of um, modern capitalist societies um, emblematized in, in the, the, the middle class life, uh, perhaps particularly in, of the 60s and the 70s, kind of show the true cards of the biological family. Uh, Precisely. Some, right. Uh, so, so that's why she wants to abolish uh, not only the nuclear family, but also the biological family. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now th that makes a lot more sense to me. Okay. Um, yeah, perhaps before we proceed to uh, uh, kind of look look into the uh, or discuss the, the premises of, of her argument, uh, we should not forget to, to mention uh, some aspects of Firestone's um, understanding of, of the nuclear family that have not aged very well, uh, such as her understanding of race relations. Uh, on the model of, of the nuclear family. Um, she thinks of, uh, and this is a quote from, from one of the chapters in her book, uh, she, she thinks of, of American race relations as a macrocosm of the hierarchical relations within the nuclear family. Um, uh, th this, this idea is not something that I um, have, have the impression that uh, most feminists find very palatable any longer. <laughs> If, if it ever was, or what would you say? Yes, that's completely right. Um, I mean, and I think Firestone's treatment of racism is quite rightly regarded as um, one of the, the, the greatest flaws of her book, really. Um, so Firestone dedicates a chapter to racism. And in some ways that in itself is problematic because in the rest of the book, in the rest of the chapters, when she talks about women, it's fairly clear that she's focusing upon white women and that she means white women, that she's not really thinking about women of colour um, at all in those other chapters. So in her chapter um, on racism, she tries to argue that race relations in America are understandable on the basis of the kind of um, the pathologies of the nuclear family and in order to illuminate those pathologies of the nuclear family Firestone has gone to Freud and Firestone has, has drawn upon Freud's idea of the Oedipus complex where um, a boy feels rivalry towards his father um, but desires his mother and wishes to kind of um, uh, eliminate or, or kill his, his, his father in order to have the um, attention of his mother without a, a rival. So um, Firestone takes that idea and uses it as a model for thinking about race relations in America and she claims that um, African-American men, for example, start out by identifying with white women because both are in a certain sense powerless or are disenfranchised and, and disempowered in American society. But they are soon, Firestone suggests, pulled out of that identification with white women by their rivalry, rivalry with the, the white father. So they desire the place of the white father. They desire themselves to become patriarchs 
and that leads them to adopt a kind of um, aggressive, dominating attitude towards both white women and um, black women. And she describes African American women as being kind of exploited and oppressed by both um, black men and white men alike. Um, now, it's an extremely um, limited and limiting analysis. First of all, as many um, black feminists have identified, and I'm thinking here of Angela Davis, for example, it actually ends up recycling certain racist stereotypes. So stereotypes about hyper-masculine black men, for example, constituting possibly even a threat to white women. It also effectively disempowers black women by presenting them as just being passive victims. It, it seems to deny black women the possibility of any political agency. I mean, I would add to that that I think it, it also, it represents an attempt to kind of exculpate white women of responsibility for their own racism. So at one point, um, Firestone says that um, in, in a sense, um, white women's racism is only secondary. White women are racist because they identify with white men, but it's an identification that's based on false consciousness. So I think there's a desire almost to say that, that, that kind of um, white women's racism is the fault of sexism. And therefore there's a refusal, I think, um, to, to ask white women to claim proper responsibility for their racism. I mean, just to, to, I could go on, but just to kind of finish this off, yeah. I'd say the other thing that's so very, very limiting about Firestone's analysis of racism is that she has absolutely nothing to say about the legacies of slavery um, or Jim Crow laws. So there's an historical structural analysis that is called for, but we don't get it. Instead, we get this attempt to fit the complexities of racism in the United States into Firestone's Oedipal model of the nuclear family. Mm. And it might also uh, appear to be a, a sort of a logical consequence of, of insisting that sex class is first class and that everything, all other relations of social oppression would have to kind of be reduced back to that. Um, Precisely, yes. Yeah. You know, if, if one says in a sense that... Um, that sexism, the sexist oppression is historically and causatively first, you know, it's, it's primary, that easily slips into supposing that it's therefore in some sense more urgent, mm -hmm. that what's really needed therefore is to tackle sexism, that that's somehow more urgent than tackling racism. Firestone mm -hmm. doesn't explicitly say that, but um, I think an attitude like that is, is possibly at work within the text. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Okay, so let's continue a little bit with um, interrogating Firestone. You have several sections of your book that have, has that uh, in its title, Interrogating Firestone. So let's interrogate her a little bit more on her theory of um, oppression. And let's start with uh, something that we've we've already kind of uh, opened up uh, and it's, it's the idea of, of uh, nuclear family um, and her um, determination to, uh, to make the abolition of the nuclear family uh, a goal of, of feminist uh, revolution. Um, is Firestone right to think that all nuclear families must be oppressive to women and children? Oh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I suspect not. I mean, I, I, I said earlier in, in, in thinking about the nuclear family that <clears throat> I think the kind of nuclear family that we have today is different, or at least has the potential to be different. And that's partly because of 50 years of, um, of a modern feminist movement. So um, I think there are many 
families today that look like nuclear families, that have something of the structure of, not, of nuclear families, that aren't organised according to these assumptions of, you know, authority, you know, the authority of the father or the husband, um, that, that don't have the kind of um, the relationships of dependency and domination hard written into them that mm-hmm. Firestone mm-hmm. was objecting to. Mm-hmm. That said, there's an awful amount of research that suggests that exploitation of specifically women's labour is still very much a feature of today's families, um, whether those are nuclear families or whether they're more complex families, you know, families based upon um, uh, you know, parents and stepchildren, for, for, for example. Um, that it's still the case, actually, that um, a great deal of work is being done by, by women. Now, obviously, one of the successes of second wave feminism has been that increasingly women are likely to have working lives outside of the home. But arguably that's produced a situation that feminists call the double burden, where women are also now working outside of the home, perhaps to the same extent that that men are. But they haven't simultaneously been relieved of work within the home. So women are still doing more of the housework, they are still doing more of the care of children, they are still doing more of the emotional labour of of families. So um, the emotional labour of caring for children, but also perhaps of caring for their their husbands mm-hmm. or their or their boyfriends. Mm-hmm. So I think it's possible to argue that despite the reforms that we've seen, that the nuclear family or its equivalent is still a structure in which there is um, not gender parity um, and where there is exploitation mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would also add to that that I think... I think the nuclear family, or at least the the kind of uh, the social promotion of the family, can be oppressive to people who are not within um, families. So, those, for example, who live alone, or people who live non-reproductive lifestyles, are very often marginalised by this idea that actually what really matters is the family, what really matters is reproductive lifestyles, what really matters mm-hmm. is having children. Mm-hmm. So I think I think there are several ways in which one can suggest that the nuclear family, or at least the ideologies that we have around the nuclear family, um, do still have oppressive elements even today. Mm-hmm. And that's despite mm-hmm. the advances that we've hopefully made since 1970. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So. Um... On, on the one hand, what, what, you, ju- what you just said um, indicate that there are might be strong um, cultural notions and b- beliefs about uh, uh, what kind of uh, lives are, are worth living, like reproductive lives are better than non-reproductive lives. That would be a kind of a cultural uh, belief that's, that might be open to, to question and, and criticism. Um, but then the other thing you mentioned about um, remaining uh, inequalities in the sexual division of, of labor uh, in the private sphere, uh, sphere combined with, with, with uh, increased um, participation by women in, in professional and productive life, that could be seen as a sort of an uh, indication that Firestone might have been onto something, that there is this kind of... Uh, hardwired inherent power uh, imbalance uh, in uh, in the reproductive unit, so to speak, that is d- difficult to root out uh, completely. I don't know. I think I think that's right, and there is a certain amount of anecdotal evidence um, that, that 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 many that many young women who um, possibly have not so much seen the relevance of feminism to their lives change that view once they become mothers. Because once they become mothers, it becomes clear how much having a child can impact upon one's life, upon one's possibilities of doing various things um, that would fulfill oneself, how one's identity might even be thrown into kind of disarray um, by the fact that now suddenly you are a mother. 
Um, and many young women, if they're in heterosexual relationships, might be looking at their now partners and thinking, well, you know, he's not affected by parenthood in the same way that, that I am. And I, so I, I do think, you know, that, that's what Firestone was, was trying to talk about, and she's not wrong in it. Um, Firestone tends to be very one-sided in her um, treatment treatments of things. She, she often kind of works through exaggeration, hyperbole. Um, she will often be very one-sidedly negative about something, one-sidedly negative about the family, for example, or one-sidedly negative about pregnancy or childbirth. So I often find myself wanting to say, yes, but. So wanting to, to kind of bring some nuance and some complexity to Firestone's analysis, but not for that reason wanting to throw the analysis out, because I think the analysis very often is pointing to something that's correct and that's actually still very relevant today. Right. Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, um, so some more potentially problematic aspects of her, her argument. Um, this idea of um, the inescapable power dynamics of the biological family. That seems to be uh, um, a, a very decisive uh, part of her, her argument. This this idea that um, the the radical dependency of of women, at least in prehistorical times, on their male partners uh, due to uh, ongoing uh, um, pregnancies, uh, birthing breastfeeding and so so forth that keep them from from uh, uh, taking part in productive life that makes makes them radically dependent on on their male partners to to provide for them etc and the kind of uh, lust for power so to speak that this generates uh, in um, in the male um, in in your book you you have an argument uh, that the queer is that that assumption uh, a little bit could you elaborate a little bit Yes, it, it's it's really relating to um, the kind of the steps in the process of causation that Firestone is trying to, to tell us about. So one of those steps is to say that um, the biological conditions of human reproduction, which include the fact that um, newborn infants are unusually dependent, I mean, you know, like newborn in infants are helpless, as we know, for, for months on end, which is unusual. Um, other, that's not the case with most other species. So those kind of facts of, of, of human biology, Firestone says, create these relationships of dependency. That's dependency of the child upon the mother, but therefore also of the mother upon the um, male partner. That dependency, then she suggests, generates in the male this lust for power, as you said, um, or this kind of psychology of power, or this psychology of domination. And I'm just not sure that that step is as secure as Firestone would like it to be. So it, the question I find myself asking is whether it must be the case that human beings will respond to a situation in which someone is dependent upon us by enjoying power and wanting to reinforce power. You know, could it not instead, for example, result in a situation where men felt increased care and compassion towards their female partners? Or might it not result in a situation where men recognised their reciprocal dependency upon women because they needed women in order to um, bring their children into the world and, and care for their children? So it's a, a step in Firestone's um, causal story that I think is not as secure as she thinks it is, and that it is worth us kind of worrying at. Mm -hmm. I, I agree greatly about that. And it seems to me that um, Firestone is a little bit too quick to buy into a sort of bleak view of human nature and particularly of, of male or masculine uh, nature that probably um, would not stand up to scrutiny in many uh, 
in much uh, social psychological research, even evolutionary uh, biological research, I, I believe you, you, you could find a lot of variation in, in the way uh, male and female reproductive partners relate to one another in, uh, in how uh, they care for, for their offspring. So, uh, Yeah, it I, seems to be a kind of implicit assumption that um, he, given, given a taste of power, human beings will crave more of it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that, that said, there's, there's an alternative way of, of thinking about Firestone's causal story, I think, which doesn't involve making the same kind of psychological assumptions that she seems to be making, which is instead just to say that the conditions of human procreation in early human history that, that we've both been unpacking were such that what came out of them were early societies where women were restricted to particular kinds of role, namely reproductive roles, and that meant that men came to predominate in other aspects of social life. And those structures then, in a sense, took on a life of their own. So because, because that, that, yeah, the, the structures themselves became self-perpetuating mm -hmm. rather than men perpetuate those structures because they've fallen in love with having mm -hmm. power. Yeah, but, but that argument actually reminds me a little bit more about uh, Simone de Beauvoir's uh, analysis uh, or her historical account in, in the second sex which uh, Firestone is a little bit um, reticent about. She's not completely buying into that, uh, it seems to me. So, so there, there must be a, li a little bit, uh, at least some amb ambivalence about on that point. Yeah. <clears throat> um, one last thing about uh, Firestone's theory of uh, oppression. Um, she has uh, gotten a lot of rap for her kind of um, uh, a sort of a tendency to what's called biological determinism. Uh, many many feminists uh, who have responded to Firestone's work uh, are, are concerned about the tendency to to make bio biology destiny, so to speak. Um, and is there is there a, a kernel of truth to that charge? Do you think? Again, it's a very important and very difficult question. I think I incline towards thinking that actually, despite appearances, Firestone is not a biological determinist. Um, or at least, if she's a biological determinist, she's only a biological determinist about early human history before human beings had the ability to intervene into um, human fertility. So. What I mean, what we haven't spoken about um, very much so far is technology um, and the kind of optimism that Firestone has about technology. So we will by, soon, soon uh, come to that. <laughs> we, we will do that. OK, well, um, I'll anticipate that a little bit now um, by saying that, that by technology, Firestone really means um, kind of human knowledge and human skills that enable us to intervene into the natural world and change features of the natural world in order to suit um, our own purposes. So Firestone holds that once human beings come to a bit more of an understanding about um, pregnancy and how to prevent it, you know, contraception, for example, or how to terminate pregnancies if they are unwanted, then we actually have the capacity to intervene into that biological state of affairs that she thinks spontaneously produces sex class or sexual mm -hmm. inequality. So mm -hmm. Firestone actually thinks that for, I don't know, centuries or maybe even millennia, um, human beings have had the opportunity to intervene into those biological natural conditions and change them, make it possible, for example, for women to have greater freedoms and greater autonomy, make it possible for women to live lives which are not um, all about reproduction. 
Firestone wants to say that that generally human societies have not chosen to fulfill that 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 potential of technology, which is a potential of technology to liberate women from their biological reproductive capacities. And the reason for that is because it's not been in the interests of men to do it. Mm. So in that sense, I think we we don't have biological determinism in, in Firestone. What we have instead is an account of early human history that says, okay, um, because of early humans' inability to intervene into human fertility, there will have been a long, long stretch of time where something like um, male-dominated cultures were more or less inevitable, you know, more or less determined by biological conditions. Mm -hmm. But actually, for many centuries, that hasn't really been the case. Mm -hmm. um, and, in, and certainly what we have in the late 20th century is a situation where um, men are reinforcing, socially reinforcing, um, women's biological dependency upon them. So I think ultimately Firestone is offering a kind of complex causation that says, in prehistory, biology was very much the origin of this, but actually there have been subsequent social reinforcements and cultural reinforcements mm -hmm. and economic reinforcements. And today, the social, the cultural, the economic are at least as important as the biological. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And also, at the very least, um, even uh, if we um, limit ourselves to, uh, to Firestone's account of, of uh, prehistory, in which uh, biology was a major determining factor, in, uh, so to speak, uh, she is very far from entertaining the kind of uh, biological determinism that sees uh, male domination as uh, a matter of uh, some kind of an innate psychology genetically wired into uh, the male's, I don't know, new, uh, central nervous system and ho hormonal system and, and all of that. Uh, so she's very far from, from um, even, even considering that possibility, it seems to me. I think that's completely mm. right. I, I think that um, Firestone tends to think of, of men and women as being in a sense, psychologically like blank slates. I don't think she, you know, she thinks that there's such a thing as a kind of hormonally male brain or a hormonally female brain. Um, or she, you know, she, she doesn't, um, she doesn't think as, as some contemporary radical feminist thought that there's something about male anatomy, for example, that disposes men to be um, to be violent or to be sadistic or anything like that. She's very, very far from that kind of biological determinism. Mm -hmm. She's also, incidentally, very far from the kind of um, from a kind of feminist biological determinism that said that women were somehow intrinsically more peaceful or more cooperative because of their biologies. You know, um, because, so the kind of claim there would be that women menstruate and therefore they're more in touch with. The cycles of nature, the seasons, they're more inclined, therefore, towards environmentalism or because women are capable of, you know, growing new life within their bodies, that they better understand the fundamental connections between human beings and they are ver therefore more likely to be anti-war. So those kinds of claims were being made by contemporary feminists. Firestone did not make them. She certainly was not biologically determinist in that sense. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Okay, so we should now make good on our promissory note to actually uh, take up the question of technology in, in Firestone, uh, finally. Um, so, Firestone has this, um, uh, which is also when we begin to uh, address uh, Firestone's revolutionary vision or her, her vision for a feminist revolution. So, so Firestone has this claim that um, uh, Atomic energy, fertility control, artificial reproduction, cybernation, in themselves are liberating, unless they are improperly used. So, um, just let us just um, look at uh, a few of those items that she listed. 
uh, and then we we're going to discuss um, um, what what may be liberating about them or what may be inherently liberating about them. So first off, um, Firestone believes that um, automation or um, the the replacement of, of human uh, labor, especially in the in so-called unskilled labor sectors, uh, will be a necessary uh, element in, in feminist uh, or uh, revolution or in the liberation of women. Um, why do you think that she she believes that? Sorry, why why automation is automation in terms of work? You mean? Yeah, so so she she is hoping or she sees uh, a sort of a, um, change already happening in her own day when um, uh, the, the more uh, 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 drudgery uh, kind of uh, work is replaced by robots, right? Automated and um, outsourced to machines, so so that it frees up. Um, time and energy for for humans to do uh, other things than than the more manual uh, unskilled kind of uh, activities uh, necessary for for production and and and, and the economy and she sees that as uh, as part of uh, the program for feminist revolution uh, and why do you think that yes uh, so sorry you're, you're absolutely right so i think it's I think it's part of her desire to eliminate all forms of exploitation and domination. Um, and, you know, despite having said that, that Firestone often has a kind of slightly limited middle class perspective, she does also recognise um, forms of economic oppression, um, particularly forms of economic oppression that take the form of low paid, exploited, um, as you say, supposedly unskilled labour, but actually it's very frequently skilled labour. Um, and I mean, one way of answering this is to go back to Firestone's relationship to Marxism. So uh, Firestone sees her radical feminism as in a sense incorporating Marxism and Marxist feminism. So she says, basically, Marx and Engels were right that what is needed is a revolution of the proletariat. So the proletariat need to seize control of the means of production um, from the bourgeois class in order that we can have um, a kind, uh, we can have a kind of a socialism, um, basically, where there will no longer be any need for alienated labour. And Firestone, as you've indicated, sees cybernetics or automation as being crucial to that. Um, she thinks that machines have the ability to relieve human beings really of, of, of labour which is unpleasant or dangerous or, or physically um, demanding. But in order for that potential in technology to be realised, there has to be radical collective action, namely the proletariat seizing the means of production from um, the dominant class. At the same time, of course, she's saying we need to have a feminist revolution which involves women as the oppressed class, sex class, seizing control of the means of, of reproduction from um, the uh, oppressive class men. So mm -hmm. she sees those two revolutions as needing to happen in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, and by happening in tandem, they promise to relieve women of their exploited condition in relationship to reproductive labour and the working classes of their exploited condition in relation to productive labour. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, we're now already um, um, on the issue of um, uh, women taking control of the, the means of reproduction, right? So this is where we arrive at the um, this uh, um, uh, ho Firestone's hope for the um, uh, development of uh, reproductive technologies that might move um, the reproductive process entirely outside uh, the female body. Um, 
And in 1970s, she believed that that was a very plausible uh, uh, outcome of of the research that she uh, was familiar with uh, in her time. Uh, she referenced particularly um, how uh, the understanding of of the um, of embryology, the development of of the the fetus inside inside the womb. Once that that process is decoded, one might be able to kind of make um, a replacement womb, so that uh, women won't have to uh, to bear that burden. Um, and and today, perhaps that might seem an, an even more plausible um, uh, possibility. Um, I'll briefly show. Um, uh, an, uh, a Guardian article uh, about this. Um, just a second. Do you see my screen now? Yes. The the Guardian article. So um, an artificial. This is an article from 2019, and its its headline says: "Artificial womb." Dutch researchers given. 2.9 million euros to develop a prototype for an artificial womb. So it's clearly uh, clo moved closer on the on the on the horizon now. And from what I understand, um, we are dealing with um, a possible meeting between two types of technology. On from the one side, there is. Um, increased capacity to keep embryos alive and developing in so-called artificial biobags. And there are now uh, trials that have successfully kept um, um, prematurely born um, lamb embryos alive in such biobags for, for extended periods of time. So, um, so they're working on perfecting that kind of technology. And from the other side, there is uh, there are efforts to to keep a fertilized egg viable and developing in a petri dish before being implanted in the womb. That's also part of of current emerging reproductive technologies. Um, uh, so, uh, if, if you're able to extend the time that you're able to keep a fertilized egg viable and developing. Uh, in a petri dish before it's implanted in a womb or something equivalent for an indefinite um, duration of time, and you're able to perfect the the, the capacity uh, of these artificial biobags that keep um, prematurely born embryos um, viable and developing for for an indefinite indefinite period of time. Perhaps at at a certain point th these two will meet and you will have actually a prototype of. Uh, an artificial womb that's that's viable for human reproduction. So this is just to to emphasize that um, um, this might be now uh, much more um, an empirical question, a question of of time and investment before this is actually uh, a, a real possibility. Um, and. How does this fit into um, Firestone's vision for, for a feminist revolution, do you think? Is this going to solve everything? Well, it, it certainly won't solve anything on its own. Um, and we come back to this idea of women needing to seize control over technologies such as this. So Firestone, I'm sure, would say that at the moment, these technologies, which it does seem might become an empirical reality, you know, within our life spans, quite possibly. Firestone would say that those technologies remain in the hands of a patriarchal capitalist system, I suppose. Um, and they are technologies that will no doubt become, you know, quickly monetized, um, and they will be deployed in ways which are serving commercial ends. And that's not at all what Firestone wanted to see happen. You know, what she was seeking was the overthrow of patriarchy and the overthrow of, of, of capitalism. So Firestone um, would want to be taking a technology such as, such as that out of corporate hands and, and out of a kind of patriarchal system. 
Um, one of the things in the dialectic of sex, which is, I think, not clear, is exactly what, what is the status of Firestone's proposal about artificial wounds. So she does propose it. She does say in this post-revolutionary society, um, we you know, might very well have artificial wounds um, and that will make biological reproduction an option in a way that it has never been before. So um, now it's not clear whether she thinks that artificial wombs are necessary in order to bring about the liberated egalitarian society that she wants to see, or whether simply the option of them is important, or whether actually she's not particularly committed to the idea of artificial wombs at all, but rather it's a kind of thought experiment, as we were saying earlier. It's a rhetorical device that estranges us from, um, from, from the way that we normally think about, about um, pregnancy and childbirth as just inevitable parts of, of human life in order that we can better reflect upon those things and think about you know, what is the value, what might be the value of biological rather than artificial reproduction. I see, that makes sense. Um, but to continue a little bit uh, further about the artificial reproduction, uh, she says in, a, in an interview um, that it's, that's part of um, um, a sort of a short doc documentary about um, the early rad radical feminists that I think it was uh, broadcast in around 1970 or something like that. Uh, and in that interview, she says that um, having the option of artificial reproduction will make a huge difference to the kind of institutions we have. That's what she said. Um, is that uh, what what you would you think she means by that? And is she a little bit too optimistic? I don't know. Well, um, she thinks one value of the option of artificial reproduction is that it opens up the um, possibility of parenthood beyond people for whom um, biological um, reproduction is possible. So that might be, um, might be heterosexual couples um, where there are fertility problems, for example. It might be um, gay couples. It might be um, trans people. It might be older people who are beyond um, childbearing age. So at, at one level, what Firestone wants to do is open up the, possi the parental possibility, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. to people whom the mere contingencies of biology might currently be excluded mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, it makes possible a different kind of institution for mm -hmm. rearing children. So we've been talking about what Firestone thinks is so problematic about the nuclear family. In the dialectic of sex, she proposes, albeit very tentatively, an alternative structure for the raising of children. And she calls this the household. So the household is a situation in which a group of adults, maybe eight to ten adults, contract to live together for a period of time in order to raise children. And Firestone says that the children raised within the household might be the biological offspring of some people within the household, um, or they might not. If there is a biological genetic connection, it won't matter. It will be culturally, emotionally, psychologically irrelevant to everybody concerned. So it may be the case that the, that the children are born through artificial wombs, for example, and um, you know, genetic parentage is, is just not a question um, at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that kind of technology, she thinks, enables, enables the possibility of um, the genetic connection between children and parents becoming much less relevant and that in turn opens up the possibility of a kind of diffused 
shared parenting where what matters is the quality of a caring relationship that an adult is able to enter into with a child, not whether the child is biologically, genetically their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I um, remember right from, from reading uh, her manifesto and your commentary on it, uh, she actually thinks that genetic relationships might actually compromise the quality of, of those, those caring relationships. Yes, that's a very important aspect of her book. Um, she is very worried about the idea of my child um, with the emphasis upon the possessive. Um, she thinks that very frequently both fathers and mothers relate to their biological children as being kind of extensions of themselves. So she says, um, for men, um, the child represents a continuation of their name, a kind of a, a claim to immortality, if you will, for women who are asked to justify their existence within a male-dominated society, the having a child is a way in which they can they can um, be recognised as valuable um, by by men. So Firestone thinks that a sick society, really, and she sort of does think that you know the society of her time is a, a sick and a deforming society. Um, a sick and a deforming society is one in which um, genetic parentage leads to a kind of an investment of parents in children as property, in a sense, as extensions of the self and as property, as a possession, and that that is damaging to all concerned, but it's particularly damaging to children because it denies children the recognition of themselves as autonomous individual beings with needs and interests and, and, and feelings of their own. So in terms of you know this question about what is the status of her proposal for artificial wombs, one reading would be to say that actually artificial wombs are needed because it's only artificial wombs that can really interrupt that relationship of genetic biological parentage that Firestone is very worried about precisely because of his possessiveness. Right. Okay. Um, so um, I, I wanted also to, to interrogate uh, Firestone a little bit about um, technology, but we've already begun to speak uh, I think amply uh, to that. Um, she's. Uh, it's kind of ironic that she has been uh, criticized both for being a biological determinist mm. and a technological determinist. Yes. Right. Um, and uh, I think you've already set out very clearly why you don't think that she is a technological determinist. And um, um, well, for those viewers. Um, uh, who are not uh, familiar with, with this term terminology, I think in my book, at least, uh, technological determinism is uh, the idea that um, a certain technology um, is not just a tool uh, for the gratuitous use for, uh, of humans, but it's also the embodiment of a certain set of values and a certain way of life. Um, uh, and it might and it embodies values that might be deemed um, positive or negative, depending on your own point of view. But if you use that technology, you're also kind of buying into a, a certain way of life and a certain set of values. Um, and and, and Firestone's uh, uh, claim that certain technologies are uh, liberating in themselves might seem to point in that direction. Um, but then she adds the caveat, unless, unless they are, um, what, what is it that she's saying? Uh, unless they're used, let me find the quote, unless they are improperly used. Um, so, um, so perhaps she's saying something like uh, technolo technological development or the arc of technological development, so to speak, bends toward 
liberation, but it can uh, easily be swayed away from, from that cause, right? right. Yes, mm. I, I, I think so. I think um, she seems at, 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 in some places to want to say something like technology in general is intrinsically liberating because technology is the possibility that human beings have to intervene into a natural world and bend it to our purposes. Um, so technology gives us a degree of, of choice and self-determination that we don't have if we are simply confronted with the natural environment that we have no mm -hmm. capacity to change. Um, so on the basis of that, she, she seems to kind of carry forward this idea that, that reproductive technologies, for example, um, should be or kind of inherently are or are bent towards being liberatory but the problem is they can be bent out of shape so they can be kind of appropriated and used for non-liberatory oppressive purposes and that that is exactly what happens when for example atomic energy is used to create the atomic bomb um, and that is what would happen if technologies that make artificial wombs possible were to be appropriated by a kind of patriarchal capitalist system for all kinds of horrible situations that we could probably imagine and that, you know, lots of science fiction novels um, probably already imagined for us. I can think of at least one, The Matrix. <laughs> um, Okay, um, so uh, now we have dealt quite extensively and uh, in places in depth with with uh, Firestone's argument uh, in in the uh, in the dialectic of sex. Uh, let's now, as we um, move towards the uh, conclusion of this this conversation, uh, look at some of the current reproductive technologies and practices that we uh, see in our in our day. Um, and try to apply a sort of a Firestonian perspective to it. Uh, you write of um, several of these in in uh, in a separate chapter in your book, and particularly um, <clears throat> the issue of egg freezing and and assisted uh, reproduction in vitro fertilization and surrogacy. So uh, let's first look at uh, egg freezing. And to continue on on the um, on the issue of technology and liberation, um, I can see uh, a certain case or a certain argument for um, the empowering or liberating potential of of egg freezing, of allowing uh, women uh, in um, in fertile and reproductive age uh, to kind of bank uh, their uh, their good eggs for. Uh, later in life, when it suits them better to have have their babies, um, um, and uh, that's um, sort of an empowering uh, technology in, in that sense. And as a bonus, it uh, it can it can be um, it can contribute to enhance the fertility rate of of the population. So kind of it serves the might serve the interest both of individual women to fulfill their kind of their rep reproductive career, their dreams of becoming mothers uh, when it suits them best in their, in their, as professionals. And it helps the, the state um, politics of, of increasing fertility. So what could be wrong about that? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll start off just by saying, yes, you're right in the way that you've unpacked the ways that it could be empowering. And there's a, there's a specifically Firestonian spin on that in a way, in that, you know, Firestone's whole thing is that if there are any inequalities that are rooted in nature, that's fine because we can change nature. So there's an obvious inequality in that um, men, or at least many men, are able to become biological parents right up until, you know, the end of their lives, and up, up until their 70s. But for women, as we know, fertility drops off significantly in the late, 30s and and really a, a woman's potential for um, becoming a mother is probably over by her mid-40s. Um, so that's a natural inequality. 
it's a natural inequality that egg freezing as, as a technology seems to enable us to address. So that looks from a Firestonian perspective like, great, you know, that, that should be um, simply empowering. To come on to your question about, okay, well, what might be the problem with this? I suppose the first thing to say from a Firestonian perspective is that it doesn't remove the problems with um, the way that, that women, Firestone thinks that women in a sense are kind of burdened by um, being identified socially as baby incubators. You know, so women almost kind of like become defined through their capacity to have children. Um, one thing that egg freezing does arguably is entrench that definition of, of women. So one of the things about egg freezing is that it started off as a medical intervention. If a young woman, for example, was going to undergo cancer treatment that might make her infertile, she could have her eggs harvested and stored so that she wouldn't lose her reproductive capacity. Egg freezing has now shifted from that into becoming more, more generally a possibility that's marketed to all young women precisely for the reasons that you're saying. So the, you know, the argument is that one can extend one's reproductive lifestyle, one can build a career, um, one can travel, etc., etc., before um, becoming a parent. So while there's a clear empowering aspect to that, there's also a sense in which even very young women, therefore women in their 20s, are being asked to think of themselves as potential baby makers. So the definition of women in terms of their reproductive biologies is arguably becoming intensified rather than loosened. So right off from a Firestonian perspective, there's potentially a problem with that. To continue the answer, um, we might look more at the kind of critical literature that's emerging around egg freezing technologies. So number one is it's very expensive. Um, it's only available therefore to a limited number of women. It's not as if it's a kind of democratic possibility for all women, regardless of income. Um, it's a cost which is privatized upon the individual. Secondly, it's a procedure that is quite physically intrusive. Um, there can be various physical problems or side effects. It can be very emotionally and psychologically disturbing and disorienting. I mean, it's effectively the first stage of, of IVF and it's long recognised that IVF can be a very traumatic process. Um, thirdly, egg freezing is by no means necessarily particularly reliable. So there's a real fear that the commercialization of this medical technology and its widespread marketization might actually be a matter of selling young women false hopes. So selling the hope that you can extend your reproductive life, you can do all sorts of things bef um, before becoming um, a mother, where in fact what women might be doing is subjecting themselves to a physically, emotionally, psychologically arduous process that's also very expensive and that has only a very, very uncertain prospect of success. Right. I see. Um, so, um, um, so there's a kind of a, a double double whammy that, there that you um, you you risk becoming a, perhaps you risk more becoming a, a failed mother in, in the sense that um, that it, um, the fertilization might not take place if if you hold it off too long anyway. Um, with uh, with uh, with your freezed eggs, and you are encouraged to live uh, in this fantasy about yourself as this potential incubator. So that, that, that I, I suppose that would be Firestone's uh, great yes. concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something in America called the pre-pregnancy movement, which is all about targeting young, very young women to think about um, their health in terms of themselves as eventually becoming pregnant. So again, it's a kind of, you know, reinforcement of a definition of women and particularly young women in terms of their procreative mm -hmm. capacities. Mm -hmm. And Firestone would be worried about that. Mm -hmm. 
but it's not impossible that in, uh, uh, under different conditions, um, different uh, material arrangements, the, uh, the economy around it, etc., uh, it might uh, play a different, uh, more constructive role in the reproductive life of, of uh, both women and men, perhaps? Absolutely. Mm. Um, I mean, I think, a, I think from a kind of Firestonian fi perspective, one would say that any technologies that enable us to, or any technologies that extend the range of possibilities or choice in relationship to human reproduction are potentially good things. Mm -hmm. But what matters is precisely the material conditions within which those technologies function. So um, who has control over them? What purposes are they used for? What interests do they serve? Who has access to them? Those questions are always going to be the key questions to ask of any technology, reproductive or otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so finally, be before we begin to, to wrap up, uh, surrogacy. Um, which is uh, a hot button uh, uh, in my in my impression. Um, so to start off uh, on that tangent, um, um, in Norway at least, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's it's not uh, commercial surrogacy at least is not legal, uh, and it's not legal in most Western countries, I believe. Um, but but there is there is a commercial surrogacy market uh, involving uh, so-called third world uh, women uh, from from the global south, and often uh, those women who engage in uh, in surrogacy contracts, uh, agreeing to uh, become pregnant with a fertilized egg of of uh, another couple and to uh, to bear that child and give birth to it. Um, the fees that they receive for that uh, typically uh, uh, greatly exceed uh, the kind of uh, wages or they would get for for more uh, the kind of manufacture labor that they would uh, otherwise um, take up or that they might not be able to take up. So, in a way, it sounds like it might be a good deal for for those women or. How would that look for, from a Firestonian point of view? Okay, so um, I suppose the first thing I'd say from a Firestonian point of view is that Firestone sees pregnancy itself as an extremely destructive process and childbirth is an extremely destructive process, physically destructive as well as potentially um, emotionally or psychologically harmful. You know, we, we know about birth trauma um, for example. So I think the first thing that Firestone might say is that technologies that make commercial surrogacy possible are not technologies that alleviate the destructiveness of those physical processes. They are technologies that transfer those processes and their destructiveness from some women to other women. So from you know relatively wealthy women of the global north to um, not wealthy women in the global south. So again, I kind of think right away, there are reasons to be concerned about this. Um, again, if one sort of looks in detail into the conditions that international commercial surrogates work in, there are reasons to be worried. So there's quite a significant kind of critical literature around this. Um, it seems that um, many commercial surrogates are in situations of some degree of coercion. There are fears that sometimes women are coerced to become surrogates, either by um, kind of abusive partners or even by men functioning as pimps, basically. There are concerns about the oppressive practices of the surrogacy clinics themselves, which apparently um, very much try to kind of um, contain women either within their own homes or within surrogacy um, hostels that, that they create. So the idea is that you put the surrogates into those hostels and you can then kind of monitor them and surveil them and you can keep them very much restricted to the, um, the hostels so that you can reassure the customer 
that um, there's no risk to the pregnancy, there's no risk to the, to the, to the infant. Um, in addition to that, it, in, terms, in financial terms, it looks like a very exploitative relationship. So yes, it's the case, as you said, that a woman who is working as a commercial surrogate might be um, might receive an income for that work that's much more than she would do in alternative forms of employment that are available to her. Um, but actually, the value that's generated through her work, that the money that the, that the the client pays, is overwhelmingly going towards the fertility clinic itself and not to the commercial surrogates themselves. So again, there are all kinds of reasons to worry about exploitation and oppressive working conditions within this industry. Now that raises a question about um, what should be done. So there is a kind of um, a growing movement for the abolition of commercial surrogacy. I can see why, there, why that movement exists. I was initially, I think, kind of quite sympathetically inclined towards it, but I also think that there are reasons to be worried about it. So um, one book that's very relevant here is by Sophie Lewis. I'll just show it to you. Um, Sophie Lewis's book, Full Surrogacy Now. Um, this is a really interesting book. I'd recommend it to viewers. But one of the arguments that, that Lewis makes in that book is about commercial surrogacy. And she basically says that that um, abolitionism is not the right answer. Um, if, if people are concerned about commercial surrogacy, then what we ought to be doing is allying ourselves with the women who actually work as commercial surrogates, joining with them and offering solidarity in their struggles to improve their own conditions. So Lewis says that there's a, a strange form of kind of exceptionalism at work around surrogacy. Yes, it might be exploited labour, but there are all sorts of ex forms of exploited labour in the world. And actually the best response to that is to um, join in solidarity with um, the, the, the workers and listen to them and find out what are the changes that they want to see happening. So her concern is that the abolitionists are basically not listening to the commercial surrogates themselves. And I have to say that I find that um, a very persuasive argument. Right. And it seems to be a, um, a similar kind of argument that's also been, been made in, re in connection with, with sex work uh, in the debates about that. Um, there is a strong feminist tradition of um, wanting to uh, uh, abolish uh, prostitution and sex work completely and outlaw every aspect of it. But there is also this strand that wants to to look look at the, the the problem from the point of view of the of the sex workers themselves, and to you're yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. Thank you. Yeah. That's a really helpful connection. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in fact, Lewis makes that that connection, and she says that that form of exceptionalism around surrogacy work is also very often um, expressed as an exceptionalism around sex work for mm -hmm. precisely the reasons that you say. Okay. Right, we, sh we should soon wrap up now. I will just pose you um, um, a last question about um, where where is um, the Firestone legacy heading now? Is there some kind of um, Firestone revival uh, in, um, in academia and in feminist organizing perhaps uh, underway these days? And do you perhaps see yourself as part of that? Um. Yes, so I, I think I think there is a kind of Firestonian revival taking place. Um, those of us who might feel that we're part of it in some sense, I think generally wish to speak about a critical Firestonianism. Um, the reason for that being that, that Firestone's work is so deeply flawed in, in, in many ways. I and mean, we've spoken about that a little bit, the kind of the middle class bias in it, the um, the, uh, the the blindness um, in relationship to issues of, of racism um, in it. There are other problems too with Firestone that we, we could have spoken about. So I think 
it's not that there is a kind of desire to go back to Firestone and to embrace that body of ideas wholeheartedly. Rather, there is a desire um, to go back to Firestone in a critical spirit, to recognise the very real problems that exist with it, but to also ask whether there might be insights within the text or even kind of theoretical coordinates within the text that can be repurposed today. And I think there are. I mean, you know, that, that's ultimately why I wrote my book. Um, so I think that, that Firestone is um, really, really important in terms of the central place that she gives to reproduction and the central, you know, her insistence that reproduction be politicised and that any feminist radical politics make issues of reproduction, reproductive rights, reproductive justice, reproductive freedom central to it. I think that's absolutely right. It's really, really important. And for that reason alone, in my view, Firestone is um, an important voice. I also think Firestone's affirmation of technology is, is very valuable. So um, Firestone's affirmation of technology is one of the things that actually makes her belonging to radical feminism a little bit problematic because most 1970s radical feminists regarded technology as being a kind of masculinist, even patriarchal endeavour that was about mastery over nature when instead we should be celebrating nature. Firestone, of course, doesn't think that at all. Um, I like Firestone's pro-technology stance. Firestone is an important influence upon various forms of cyber feminism. She's also increasingly now an important influence upon something that's recently emerged, and that's called xenofeminism. Um, Zeno with an X, right? X E N O. Zeno with, yes, yeah, Zeno with an X, yes. So xenofeminism, um, it's kind of gesturing towards a feminism that embraces um, otherness, that embraces the alien or, or the, the, the foreigner. Um, and xenofeminism first emerged in 2015 as a manifesto by the Laboria Kubonics um, collective. Subsequently, in 2018, Helen Hester wrote a book called Xenofeminism, um, which expresses her iteration of that xenofeminist project. And Helen Hester explicitly credits Firestone as being an influence upon her. So Hester's xenofeminism is techno-materialist, um, by which she means that technology is all around us. I mean, technology is the fabric of our lives. That's going to continue to be the case. Technology is going to become ever more important to us. There's no return to a kind of pre-technological world. So therefore we ought to think serious about, seriously about technology and embrace its liberatory potentials. Hester's xenofeminism is also anti-naturalist in very much the same way that Firestone is. Um, so Hester says, you know, explicitly, um, nature is not this kind of sacrosanct realm. If any forms of human equality or oppression are to some extent rooted within natural conditions, then we should change those natural conditions. Um, and Hester's work finally is... Um, against gender dimorphism. So gender dimorphism is the idea that, you know, there just is a binary. People are male or people are female. Um, and that, you know, that, that, yeah, that there's a binary, that there's no kind of in between. It's um, very evident now that we have a young generation of people who are increasingly willing to identify themselves as um, being gender fluid. Um, perhaps who don't feel comfortable as being identified as a, as a man or as a or as a woman. We're seeing a proliferation of a gender neutral pronoun. You know, they, for example. Um, again, actually, there's real kind of um, there's a basis for that in Firestone's work because one of the aspects of Firestone's post-revolutionary society is that it is one that would make um, anatomical sex irrelevant. So Firestone says, you know, um, there will continue to be anatomically sexed beings in this post-revolutionary society, but it won't matter. Um, it won't be possible to have an expectation about what you or I are like, psychologically, emotionally, behaviourally, on the basis of what our bodies look like. Um, 
So yes, in, in those respects and in various other ways, I think that Firestone's relevance is becoming increasingly recognised in feminist um, circles today, mm -hmm. albeit, and I do need to emphasise this, in that critical spirit. Mm -hmm. And your book has certainly uh, contributed greatly to uh, to that end. I think you very forcefully uh, lay out, uh, lay out uh, um, Firestone's argument in both uh, a generous and also a critical way, which is also uh, highly appreciable from, from a philosophical point of view, I would say. So thank you so much for writing the book. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today about, about your book and about Firestone. And um, I wish you the best of luck with, with future projects, whether Firestonian or otherwise. Well, thank you very much. And, and again, you know, um, thank you very much for, for the invitation to do this. I really enjoyed the conversation. And um, thank you to, to viewers who have, who have stuck with us. All right. So I think we are logging off then. So thank you. Bye bye.